Thank you. Um, so, welcome everyone to Multiregion Cassandra in AWS. I have a lot of content to go through and only 40 minutes, so let's start. Hope you enjoy. First of all, who am I? My name is Mario Fernan Lazaro. Uh, I work as a big data engineer at Gangam. I was born and raised in Spain. That's my weird accent come from. And I joined Gangan 18 months ago, and I have about a year and a half of experience working with Cassandra in production. Let me talk a bit about the company I work for, Gangam. Gangam is an online advertising platform uh, that was founded in 2007, and we can probably say that we invented the in image advertising content, which means displaying ads on top of images, like the one that you see here, uh, right where you focus your site. We have other products like in screen and standard banners, native ads, RTV ads. Now, let me give you some numbers that we are really proud of. Like, for example, we are the fifth ad platform in the entire US. We work with more than 2,000 premium publishers, all of them really well known in their domains. And just to give you an idea, um, we reach more than 1 billion global unique visitors. And this number keeps growing and growing. All the numbers that you see here, they are going to be not valid in one month. And we process more than 2.6 billion images per month. It's like, uh, it's crazy. The growth rate is like, and Right now we are 123 employees located in seven offices across the entire US and one office in London. Now let's check the agenda. We're going to start talking about the old cluster, no multi region at all, just one cluster, why we were using Cassandra, uh, what were the use cases there. And then we will jump into the international expansion. Um, why we decided to start this Cassandra multi-region in AWS. We'll go through the big challenges that we face there, testing that we did before putting in production, modus operandi, how we did this in production, the real work, some tips now that we have uh, multiple data centers, how to do maintenance there. It's, it's different. Uh, when you have one, it's super simple. And finally, questions and answers. So uh, let's go back to March 2015. By that time, Gangam was using just one Cassandra data center, one cluster with one data center. It's the one that you see here, 25 classic nodes cluster, uh, all of them in one region, one rack, hosted in AWS. Uh, AWS stands for Amazon Web Services. We use Amazon as our cloud provider. And uh, by the time, we were using the version 2.0a, was the latest one when we built it, one of the latest ones. And in, on the client side, we were using the Datastack SQL driver, the Java version. Uh, we, we were using uh, Cassandra, and we still use Cassandra to store our entire metadata, which includes uh, visitors' data, images and pages' data, like, uh, for example, things that we have been able to recognize in an image using our patented image recognition system, like, for example, oh, in this image there is a girl, and she's blonde, and these keywords appear there inside, all kind of things that you can imagine, and add performance to keep track of number of views, number of clicks, number of everything uh, for each ad. Here we have two use cases. Let's go with the first one. First one will be the real-time use case it's for real-time data access. In order to serve ads, we need data that is in Cassandra, and we store like literally like billions of rows in different tables, key spaces. So it means that per day we query billions of rows. Uh, this presents a heavy read workload. I would say around 60% reads, 40% writes. And something really characteristic is that we use TTLs everywhere. TTL stands for uh, time to leave. So this is really amazing. We don't need to delete data. Cassandra is going to do it by itself. Uh, but you really need to understand the impact of using TTLs everywhere. You're going to create tombstones. You need to, you need to know that your compaction strategy is going to get rid of these ones. Otherwise, you can end up like, with thousands of tombstones that you read every time you request something. And your latency is going to increase and increase. It's crazy. We do heavy and critical use of counters. We, we used to, then it was impossible with 2.0 version of Cassandra. Now we are using 2.1. We use counters again. And with a high percentage of this uh, heavy read workload is because we do RTV ads. RTV stands for real-time bidding ads. Um, for these people not familiar with the advertising content, basically you can think about this ad like in the stock market. So an impression will come in one of our publishers. 
and this guy wants to display an ad in, let's say, this place. So uh, someone, in this case us, we will conduct an action. We will go to the stock market, conduct an action, and different advertisers, uh, they will bid on that place because they want to display an ad there. And after that, one of them will win and will be able to display the ad. So as you can imagine, this needs to happen like in nothing. We are talking about a total execution time of 15 milliseconds here. And in order to serve RTV ads, we need to contact Cassandra, get some data that is there, right? So you can imagine that our retrieval latency needs to be like as low as possible. Talking about the analytics use case, uh, basically we run daily ETL jobs to extract joint data uh, from Cassandra. And back in March uh, 2015, we were using Hadoop MapReduce jobs to do that, and Presto for some hot queries. So now that we know the status in March, um, let's talk about the international expansion. In March 2015, um, we decided to open a new data center in Ireland, Amazon, EU West. And just because we saw, like, as I say, we keep growing and growing, we saw a really big business opportunity there, so we say, okay, let's start one there, let's start serving ads uh, from Europe uh, to Europe. That's, why, that's when this international expansion uh, happened at Gantam. And um, at the very beginning, we, we just did some brainstorming. What we need to do there? Do we need to put Cassandra there? It's really necessary. Uh, maybe we just need to put just everything except the data tier. We are talking about Cassandra. And every time an app comes, we just need to go to Virginia, US East, get the data, go back. This is not going to work, right? RTV, total execution times 15 milliseconds, no possible. So uh, after the brainstorming, we decided that we were going to open this data center with Cassandra there. And we're going to use the AWS Virtual Private Cloud. It's like the next version of the classic cloud. And basically, it gives you more control over your networking. It's more secure. It's the next version. Although we know that this was going to present some connectivity challenges, not issues, for us. It's OK. Also, we decided to replicate the entire data with the same number of replicas. So everything that we have in Ireland, in US East, Virginia, is going to be in EU West uh, Ireland. And this is the first step we decided to do, um, start some Cassandra test data centers in US East, EU West, and test how this Cassandra multi-region works in AWS. Um, run some capacity performance test, because we want to just build the new Cassandra cluster that we are going to use for the entire year. We expect three times more traffic in Q4, and we don't want in Q4 to go there, have scalability issues, um, add more nodes, remove nodes. We just want to run smooth. So, this is, looks simple, right? Like, it starts and test data centers, it works, go through the documentation. It's too good to be true. How many times you have gone to a, you have written an open source documentation that has, let's say, eight points, and it says, you follow this guide, these two valid points, eight, and then at the end, your software is going to be up and running, right? It, it never happens. <laughs> so, um, let's talk about the big challenges that we face there. First one, problems between Cassandra and EC2 Classic, uh, BBC and the data stacks Java driver. First of all, uh, I encourage you to use the EC2 multi region snitch. If you are in Amazon and you are going to have <coughs> multiple data centers, use this one. And, and you cannot go with the EC2 snitch, that one uses private IPs. <coughs> this one uses public IPs. But what happens here? EC2 instances don't have a, a, an interface with a public IP address, which means that nodes cannot connect between each other in this, if they are in the same region with public IPs. It's not possible. So, how to fix this, how, how to deal with this? Well, uh, you are going to need to understand how Cassandra nodes interact with each other, which ports they use, and you are going to need to play with the security groups there, trust those IPs for nodes in the same region, the public IPs of these guys, and um, yes, play. You need to trust everything there. This is an example, so I, I just started one Cassandra test data center, only one, with EC2 multi-region snitch, and I SSH one of the nodes and run node tool status, and it was like, Cassandra was able to tell me like, oh, this is the list of nodes that you have here, everything is cool, but there was something weird there. It's this question mark here. It was, uh, Cassandra was unable to tell me like, that the, my cluster was up and running. What was happening with my nodes? They were down, leaving. They were perfect, you know. That's because of the public IPs issue. 
Second thing, region-to-region -region connectivity. <coughs> we'll use public IPs. It's okay. What we decided to do is just uh, trust those IPs from one region to the other region, and every time we scale up, we just need to add a new IP there. Other thing you can do, other companies do, is um, use software hardware VPN, but it works fine. Just public IPs, you don't put this extra layer there, it just works. And finally, from the client side, well, um, your application in the same region, when it's going to contact Cassandra in the same region, it needs to use private IPs. You cannot use public IPs because of the same reason I said before, right? And how this works? Well, uh, at the beginning you will start your, uh, your client, and this one will try to connect to Cassandra with a host that you gave, you gave to him. And this one is probably it's going to be a private IP. So it's going to go to Cassandra, one Cassandra node. And this Cassandra node is going to return the list, the entire list of nodes in that cluster. But this one is going to be all public IPs. We cannot use public IPs, right? So how to deal with this? You need to implement um, the address translator interface that comes with Cassandra data stacks. That basically what it's going to do is translate these IPs from public IPs to private IPs on the fly, and then your client is going to be able to connect to all the Cassandra nodes. <coughs> Other big challenge here, uh, talking about the data stacks Java driver load balancing, uh, it's amazing. Basically, in data stacks Java client, it allows you to specify how you want your client to connect to your Cassandra nodes. Which nodes should I use, right? There are multiple choices. And when you go multi-region, you check them, it's like a bunch of them. And what we decided is to use uh, DC Aware, which is data center aware that tells to my client that, hey, this, this is your local data center. Use this one. Don't go, you are in US East, don't go to EU West to get the data. Uh, plus the token aware policy that basically tells our client that you should get the data from these three nodes. These three nodes have your data. Okay? But looks like for us, something is missing here, right? This is a quote from one of the Netflix engineers that says that clients in one AC, availability zone, same concept of rack here, attempt to always communicate with Cassandra nodes in the same AC. We call this zone aware connections. And this feature is building to ask and ask. What this means exactly? Well, imagine that you have your web app in three different availability zones, some of them in one A, some of them in one B, some of them in one C. And also you have a Cassandra data center spanning three availability zones with three replicas. So some nodes will be in 1A, some nodes in 1B, some nodes in 1C. And because we are using network topology strategy, my replica, one replica is going to be in 1B, next uh, 1A, next in 1B, next in 1C. So a request comes from the internet, goes through the load balancer, and hits one server that we have in 1B, one of our clients. This guy, uh, because we are using DC Aware, knows that needs to contact this Cassandra data center. And because we are using also token aware, need, uh, it knows that my data is in one of these nodes. But if we add on top of it some our connections, this guy will try to get the data from the node in 1B. So we avoid extra network hooks. That the latency is going to decrease, right? This is not in data stacks. We added it. It's what we call the RAC AC awareness to, to the token aware policy. And as you can see here, um, this is the rate request latency with clients using the default one. It will be the red line. And this is uh, clients using this new one. And as you can see, the latency is, is lower, so it's better. Same for red request. So, next challenge that we took upon ourselves, the third data center. We decided to create an extra data center just for analytics, because we keep running more and more uh, ETL jobs every day, and we don't want them to impact the real-time data access, right? So, uh, in order to do this, we decided to put a Spark on top of Cassandra nodes for this analytics class, the, uh, data center, and just get rid of Hadoop, and use the Spark Cassandra data stash connector. It's extremely easy to use. Uh, in this analytics data center, we decided to replicate just specific key, the key spaces, just the one that we need, and uh, lose, use less nodes with larger disk space. We don't care here about read request latency, it needs to be super low or anything, it's just we want our jobs to run, right? And as you can imagine, settings there are completely different. Like for example, Bloom filter chance is completely different, we don't care here, we are going to do like full table scans here, mm, number of concurrent writes, reads is going to be way higher, we don't care about latency. This is how it looks like. Uh, we'll have the Cassandra only data center for real time with a lot of nodes, 
and the Cassandra with the Spark on top of it that we will use for analytics with less nodes. Now, let's go next challenge. Uh, we decided to also, you know, we are doing, we are going multi-region, starting new data centers. Let's also upgrade from 2.0 to 2.1. Why? Uh, well, because uh, counters implementation in pre 2.1 versions in Cassandra is like is, is buggy. They, they don't work. Seriously, like crazy. Uh, and we know that in 2.1 they they rebuild them from scratch. And the way they work is completely different. So we decided, like, okay, let's try them. We'll talk about this a bit uh, later. And next challenge, uh, to choose or not to choose virtual nodes. Um, as I said before, we were using classic nodes, but just because classic nodes, they work fine with Hadoop. If you use virtual nodes, and let's say you have many nodes, like 50 nodes, and you use 256 token ranges, uh, basically it means that Hadoop is not going to work. You are going to run into weird issues, like, uh, for example, too many open files, connection issue is, is crazy. So, previous one was using uh, MapReduce jobs. Uh, and, and it adds some complexity for adding and removing nodes because now you need to manage the token ranges yourself, right? That's not good. In the new one, as you can imagine, we decided to use uh, virtual nodes. Why? Because we are going to get rid of Hadoop. We are going to use Spark. And we know Spark works fine with virtual nodes. There's zero issues there. And also, it's easy to add and remove new nodes as traffic increases. Some bad side of this, uh, repairs, they take forever. If you have, let's say, 300 token ranges, it's OK. And now, let's go with the testing phase. Before jumping into testing, um, I encourage you to have some automation process there, uh, because testing requires like creating and modifying many Cassandra nodes. And this task is like, it's a repetitive task, it's time consuming. Uh, so what our amazing DevOps team uh, did is like create a fully automated process for creating, modifying, destroying, do everything you want uh, for uh, with Cassandra clusters using Ansible. So myself, that I know that the box guy, I was able to start a Cassandra cluster with let's say five data centers in different regions of the world by just changing some settings here in this uh, template and just clicking one button. After 20 minutes. I was able to start playing with this test data center. And now let's jump into the testing performance phase that we did there. Um, we run some performance tests using the Cassandra 2.1 stress tool, which is uh, it's amazing. Uh, it allows you to recreate your schemas. You can see here we, we recreate one of the tables that we have, visitor one, same number of columns that we have, uh, following the same distribution for the size. Uh, this many requests and writes every time I do a read. It's, extremely useful and super easy to use. And you are not going to play with real data, right, but close to. So uh, we uh, spun up this uh, Cassandra cluster with number of nodes that we thought we were going to need. And we just try to find things there, right? Run a stress tool. This is OK. We need more. Let's add more nodes. Run more tests. What's happening there? Also, while doing this performance test, we wanted to test this uh, replication overseas. The latency. How this is going to work, right? Because it's like magic. Looks like magic for us. So uh, what I can tell you is this replication works asynchronously. It doesn't impact latency. It's just amazing. Um, we discovered that only one Cassandra node will contact only one Cassandra node in a different data center for sending this uh, mutation. And that's amazing. It means that if you have one data center with uh, 12 replicas, which is crazy, but no. And another data center with 12 replicas, only one Cassandra node will contact, will send this to the other data center. Also, in your client, you need to use uh, local consistency levels because you don't want clients in, let's say, Virginia, contact Cassandra to get the data, uh, contact the Cassandra that we have in Ireland. And uh, also, we were like, okay, this works. Replication obviously works, but when I'm going to be able to read something that I had to read in Ireland from US East, right? So we were about to run some tests there, but then we saw this amazing blog, again, Netflix. Uh, that they were worried about this. They ran the same test that we were about to run using Amazon. So they started uh, one Cassandra data center in US East, another data center in US West. 
And uh, they did one million rides with consistency level one here in Virginia, US East. And then they proved that they were able to read, to do one million reads after 500 milliseconds with consistency level one with zero data loss. It means that in 500 milliseconds, all the data was replicated. And this works for us. This is more than enough, more than we need. So we decided to continue. About instance type, we test all kind of we test all kind of instances that Amazon provides you. Um, and we decided to go with R3 to a large machines. They have 60 gigabytes of RAM, uh, 8 cores, 160 gigabytes of ephemeral SSD storage that we use for the commit logs and save caches. And a RAID 0 over 4 SSD EBS volumes that we use for the data. This is the best use case, is the performance cost and Gangan use case is, is the best option for us. But if money is not a problem, you should go with I2 instances. It's the same settings, but they have like huge SSD ephemeral storage. And we know that Cassandra uh, loves SSD, right? But we decided to, you know, um, just go with R3 uh, to a clutch, and if we need more machines, we will have more. The upgrade that we talk about, uh, well, we test this upgrade, how, how to do this upgrade from 208 to 2.15. And what we saw is that uh, both versions can go have it in the same data center. It means that you can do a rolling upgrade, as simple as that. It's extremely simple. Uh, so uh, this was, we saw that this was not, uh, is, was not gonna be a, an issue while doing this in production. And we decided to test these new features that are in 2.1, right? Like we wanted to use, like for example, the that, that uh, tier compaction strategy. Uh, we have time series data. We tested it, we, we love it. So we decided that in production at some point we will use it. Incremental repairs, uh, we know that repairs are a headache and more if you use virtual nodes. This helps you a lot. You should try it, extremely simple. And counters, they work. Finally, 2.1, they work. So don't be afraid of using counters if you have 2.1. If you are not on 2.1, don't even try. And now let's go into the modus operandi, how we did this in production, right? Like real stuff. First of all, to sum up, we are going to go from one cluster with one data center in US East, remember Virginia, to one cluster with two data centers in US East and one data centers in EU West, which is Ireland. So it's going to look like this. We will have our old cluster. We will add the new ones that we want with all the settings that we want. And at the end, we are going to get rid of the old one with zero downtime. First step here, upgrade the old cluster snitch from EC2 snitch to EC2 multi-region snitch. You can do this in a rolling upgrade. It's extremely easy, it works. You just need to make sure that you play with the security group, you trust, those, uh, trust these uh, IPs. Also upgrade the clients to handle it, the translators that we talk about. And uh, it's extremely easy to do, but we found this bug while doing this in production. Like basically, uh, you need to make sure that your clients don't lose connection to upgrade Cassandra nodes. We open a ticket, I think it's gonna be fixed <coughs> next version. Uh, it's, this is crazy because you do the rolling upgrade and you do one, next one, probably you are using consistency level one and you don't see anything. Cassandra is telling you that everything is fine. But your clients are not able to reconnect to this Cassandra now, to the upgrade one. It's like, it doesn't work, they can't, there is a bug there. So what happens is like, you, do, you continue doing the rolling upgrade and at some point, everything crashes. And I mean, imagine, we were in production, right? It was like, oh my God, what's happening here? Yes. You restart your clients and everything works. So make sure that this doesn't happen to you. Second step, upgrade the all data center from 208 to 2.15. Things that you need to do, as I said, rolling upgrade and just run no tool upgrade stables. Uh, just because uh, 2.15 node is gonna be able to read as stables in an old format. But when it comes to streaming data, like let's say a repair and they need to stream data, they are not going to be able to do that. They are not going to be able to write these new Bloom filters and metadata for these tables. And uh, we are not crazy. Uh, you can think like, why you are doing this in your old cluster if you are going to get rid of this one, right? Uh, well, it's because it's not possible to reveal, to get the old data um, to a 2.1 Cassandra node from a 2.0 Cassandra data center. You will try to do this. Hey, guy, give me the old data. I need it. Different versions, boom, exception. It's exception. It's not gonna work. 
On Thursday, uh, we're going to start uh, EU West and new USC's data centers within the same cluster. At the beginning, we're going to put replication factor uh, of zero for the new guys. We just want them to start and make sure that everything works fine there. No data is going to go there, no new data. Then we're going to play with the DC surface as a hub to differentiate between new Virginia data centers and the old one. Otherwise, they will join, same ring. And uh, at the beginning, our clients are not going to talk to new data centers. Just Cassandra know that they exist. That's all. After that, uh, we're going to uh, change the replication factor to three for the new real-time data centers and one for analytics. We just need one replica there. It means that they are going to start receiving new data. We are going to start replicating new data or repair data. And after that, we are going to do a node tool rebuild from the old data center to get the old data. How this looks like? Well, at the beginning, we have our clients and our all cluster with replication factor three. That's all we have. We are going to add uh, these new data centers, uh, one in US East, lot of nodes, one in Ireland, lot of nodes, and another one in US East for analytics. Then we are going to change the replication factor from 00, zero to 331. It means that we're going to start replicating new data here and here, and also here, but just one replica for uh, analytics. And after that, we're going to start rebuilding them to get the old data. So you can trigger multiple rebuilds at the same time. It's OK. Just make sure that you don't saturate your network. You don't want that to happen, believe me. Uh, and this process takes time. We are uh, talking about, we are transferring like terabytes of data, but it's okay. So we rebuild them, all of them, US West, all of them at the same time. We don't care about high CPU here, like red nodes, because remember our clients are talking to the old Cassandra cluster. We don't care about latency here yet. After that, we are going to start using these new data centers. So it means that our clients are going to change, and clients in Europe are going to start using the Cassandra data center in Europe, in Ireland, and clients in the rest of the world are going to start using US East real time to get the data. After that, we're going to change the replication factor of the old cluster to zero, just to make sure that we don't replicate data there, we're going to get rid of that guy, right? And uh, we're going to start the commissioning. Uh, I recommend you to do this and not go to your console and just terminate your instances because you don't want to end up in a bad gossip state. That's really bad. It takes like days to clean. And also it's safe because now our replication factor uh, is zero in the old cluster, so we are not going to stream the old data to the rest of the nodes of this data center. So we decommission all of them, and at the end, boom, we have what we want. So, tips here, lessons that we learn. Um, talking about maintenance, when you only have one Cassandra data center, maintenance is extremely easy. It's like just some repairs, some compactions, boom, done. When you have multiple data centers in different regions of the world, this is not that easy. What we did is we built this piece of software uh, that used Ansible to trigger uh, the maintenance operation, like cleanups, repairs, compactions. And uh, it uses a Cassandra maintenance key space that we put the data there, like we have repaired this node uh, at this time, and we have done these things there. It has taken this much time. So then Ansible knows that, OK, I read from Cassandra, I get the data, and then I know that my next node that I need to do a repair, for example, is going to be this guy. And also an email report that uh, I, I believe we get this email report every 10 days uh, or 11 after the gray, uh, garbage collector grace period. And just tell us that the status of all the nodes, if we have been able to repair them on time. But Ansible is going to take care of that. It's going to try to make it on time. Other tips, I said that now we are using a SPAR, right? Not Hadoop. Um, well, things that we have learned is that the number of workers can be above the number of total Cassandra nodes in your analytics cluster. It's OK. You don't care about latency there. Okay? Each worker, for us, this works, use one fourth number of cores of each instance and one third of total available run of each instance. Remember that we have um, a Spark on top of Cassandra. Things that we have learned about this Cassandra while using the Cassandra Spark connector is that uh, you don't want to use reduce byte, believe me, and you don't want to start like shuffling data terabytes. 
uh, instead use span by simple. It just works with partition, so you are not going to shuffle all data. Join with Cassandra table. We love this one. It's like, okay, I, I need to get the data. I have these terabytes of data coming from, let's say, Elasticsearch, and I need to get information that is in Cassandra, but, but only for these guys, right? John with Cassandra table is just one line, and it's going to contact Cassandra to get just the data that you need. It's really simple. And then there are a bunch of settings that I recommend you to go through the documentation, read it, make sure that you understand them, and play with them, because you can improve performance by a lot. Like, for example, here are two examples. The batch size, you can play with that. Uh, again, you don't care about that as in here. Or, for example, the number of uh, concurrent writes. It's OK. And something really important is that, remember, we are using EC2 multi-region snitch here. So you are going to need to do the translator thing also for your SPAR apps. It means that uh, you just need to implement the SPAR Cassandra Connection Factory, set it in the SPAR conf, and then uh, SPAR <coughs> will be able to connect to all your Cassandra nodes. Otherwise, your SPAR jobs are going to run, probably, uh, but they are going to only hit one Cassandra node, and that's something that you don't want. And uh, since Cassandra in US, Ireland, this is the status of our cluster. We have one in Ireland. We have US East data center, more nodes there. The analytics one, and because we went through all this pain and we know that this process works, this model supernatural works, we decided to open a new data center. And if this took us like literally like month to complete, we opened the new data center with Cassandra there like in just one week. So we open US West data center with Cassandra there to start serving US West traffic from US West. Um, that's all. Uh, now it's time for questions and answers. Uh, I'm telling you that Gangam is hiring. You just need to go to this page. You will see we have a lot of uh, engineer open positions there. Uh, it's an amazing place to work, uh, believe me. And well, I hope you enjoy it. What's been your experience with the day tier compaction strategy given the problems, inherent problems with day tier compaction? Yeah, so basically, if. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Um, what are my experience working with data tier compaction strategy, given that there are a lot of issues there? Uh, well, if you always write on time, your writes are always like next, next. You not go back and you write something that happened like 30 minutes ago everything is going to work fine. If you don't do that, uh, that's tough. Like, you don't want that to happen. You can end up with thousands of tables or a table not getting compacted at all. Uh, that's why I say that we tested it and we love it, but still it's not in production, still in our test data centers. Because we know that there are uh, data stacks is doing some improvements there. And we just want to wait and then we will test again. But the concept itself, it's super simple. And um, while testing, it was like perfect. Latency was way lower than using like size tier compaction strategy, for example. And right now, I can tell you that we run major compactions every month, less than a month. So at the end, our latency is as better, as, as good as uh, using time series, uh, this one, the new one. But we're going to wait to use it in production. Yeah. But I know even in the documentation it says the counters diverge and it's fine. So like diverge 15%. That's okay. So are you, is it okay for you? Like, uh, to lose? Okay. Yeah. So the question is uh, if it's okay the accuracy that counters provides you, if it's if we are okay with that? We are. Like we, our client knows that we can have some accuracy issues. We can handle that. Do you have something on top to fix that, or uh, you just, uh, uh, just for your case, for your case, uh, having this uh, discrepancy in counters is fine? Yeah, for our use case, having this discrepancy is fine. Like, we want to keep track of, for example, number of views in this app. We always want to over-deliver. We want our advertiser to be really happy. So we can just always do a bit more, right? 
that can happen with this counter saturation. So it's okay. Um, I'm interested why you chose RAID 0 for your data storage partition rather than DevOps. Okay, so um, that's, cool. uh, that's a DevOps question. <laughs> like a software engineer. So and I don't have my DevOps thing here, so sorry. Have you, did you test it all, JBot? They tested like a bunch of different ones. Uh, I, I cannot really answer that question. You can. We can contact on LinkedIn. I will ask them for sure. You can reply you back. Yeah? I just wanted to clarify. When you say you set the RF back RF zero on the cluster, you just mean you iterate through all the key spaces and you set RF zero? Yes, exactly. Okay. All the key spaces. Sorry. Do you have any use cases of uh, conflict resolution across multiple uh, data centers, like say, users with the same email address signing up at the same time? Not really. Uh, also because uh, even though we replicate the entire data, users that are in Europe like, most likely are going to keep that data center always, like high percentage of times. Um, but we, we haven't faced that issue yet. We have all the data there and it's just in case like Amazon goes crazy, okay, we're going to redirect the entire traffic to Ireland, right? Or now to US West. Like, we did that. Like, um, I don't know if you guys use Amazon, but this week they did some funny things with Dynamo, like cool things, thank you. Uh, everything was down, it was like a, it was like a mess. And we redirect the entire US traffic to only US West. So it's hard for these use cases. Another question. Yeah. So, uh, one of our customers in Europe has been saying that uh, I don't want my data to leave the EU shores at all. Uh, to, to leave what? Sorry. To leave the European shores. Oh. It has to be only in Europe. I don't want that data to come. Yeah. So. What, what do they do with that? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> the question. I forgot. It's uh, um, what what happens if we have some customers in Europe that they don't want their data to leave Europe, right? To go to a data center in US East. We don't have that. We are, we are lucky, right? <laughs> so, uh, no, seriously, I mean, they, they don't, they haven't asked us. We don't have that security. Well, we issue. don't have any PII. That's right. That's BP of engineering. We don't have any PII, so it doesn't matter. <coughs> yeah? You mentioned that you run a compaction every month. Do you run regular repair also? Yes, so um, this um, Ansible plus Cassandra PSpace plus the email report is going to do it by like, itself. In order that in 10 days I need to repair this Cassandra cluster, I don't want to resurrect, uh, delete data, bad data. So it knows that, okay, I need to trigger more and this time, like for example, when we are here in Europe is night, so it knows that, okay, now I can play with Europe, then night time here I can play with USC, so is handling all these things. I know there are some open source tools that people announce here at the Cassandra Summit, uh, Netflix, no, Spotify. They, they have done this. It's an open source tool, they have open source it. But the difference is the same content, but they are using MySQL to store this. We use Cassandra. I mean, why not, right? I mean, this is Cassandra maintenance operation, so just use Cassandra. Although, that one has way more features, REST API and stuff. That's the best option. Uh, then you have like 800 gigabytes of SSD, everything there. We just prefer to have more nodes. And that's why we know that these uh, R32 large instances, they have um, 160 gigabytes of internal storage. We use for the commit logs and safe caches. 
And for the data is just EBS, which works fine for us. SSD. Yeah, SSD EBS. And we can parallel both operations. And it's way less expensive. Also, something really good about EBS is that is that if your instance die, you can recover like in minutes. Do you know what is the difference? No. I don't know the latency difference between uh, SSD and EBS. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Not really. We will run repairs because we have some data. Yeah, exactly. As long as we. As long as it's not a signal, you're good. Yeah, and as long as we do this like really quick, like in less than 10 days because of the garbage collection uh, issue, it's okay. It's way better. I would say. Welcome. Okay. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you.